Louis C.K. is here. GQ magazine calls him America's undisputed king of comedy. The New York Times says he is a performer of the moment whose moment keeps getting bigger and bigger. In 2010, he created the comedy series Louis. It revolves around a single father of two who struggles to balance his comedy career with being a single dad. It recently returned to FX after a 19-month hiatus. Here is the teaser for the new season. admit you love me and so how am I ever to know you always tell me perhaps 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 the all new season of Louie on FX not only do they talk about you being the undisputed king of comedy and, and people love this show there are these I mean yours is deeper and broader uh, comparisons to Lenny Bruce, comparisons mm. to Bob Dylan, comparisons to being a sort of philosopher king. Mm, Jesus. <laughs> Do you oh. want to not talk about that because <laughs> it, it, it should be... <laughs> where, where does it come from? And what? how do you see what you are? I don't know. I mean, I'm just a comedian, you know. I yeah. think that's the bedrock of what I am. I do a lot of other things. Yeah. You know, I have a TV show and I have... Um, I act a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I'm a dad and I'm a comic. That's really mostly what I am. So anything beyond that, I always yeah. get a little uncomfortable. And you I'm good at writing and directing yeah. and stuff. I'm good at that stuff. But you I think you were doing that before you. Yeah, I've been doing that for a while. Yeah, yeah I love doing those things. I always feel like I'm trying those things, though. As even if I, I'm always feel like I'm just trying that. But it takes a while to make a comedian, doesn't it? Yeah, it takes a long, long time. I mean, to make a really thoroughly good, you know, to a ripe baked. <laughs> ready for you know, ready to pull the ready bottle out of the time or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ready to really actually look at from all angles. What does it take? Living. Like, yeah, you know, it takes a understanding life through living it, and then yeah. uh, uh, being on stage an awful lot and not giving up. That's all. It's just you know, and being prepared to fail. Oh yeah, that's really the road. The, fa the failure is the road to being a great comic. I think so. If you always kind of back away from the tough things and and yeah. find easy routes. You'll do okay. So failure is what? Not being funny? Yeah, no, well, not succeeding yeah. in the moment. So maybe being funny, but nobody got it or something. Right. If you don't get a laugh or you have a bad show or you're starting to feel a little uncomfortable, yeah. there's a comfort factor that feels real good, and it's nice to wear it once in a while. But when you yeah. stray off the road, you know, it's like if you're on a vacation and you're seeing everything that was sort of laid out for you where everybody else has been, but if you take a road off to the side and you feel a little uncomfortable all of a sudden, you know what I mean? Yeah. There's no obvious tourist things, and but you're seeing, you're learning an awful lot all of a sudden. But failure has been a subject of yours, too. I mean, not just, yeah. the, not just that failure shapes you, mm -hmm. but you talk about failure. Yeah, it's <clears throat> a fascinating thing because most people avoid it. So if you can get to a place where you kind of like it, you know? Yeah. I mean, you like what you get out of it. Uh, then it's it's new territory, you know. What do you learn as a comedian in that twenty five years? You actually cited twenty five years. It takes twenty five years to make a comedian. What is it you learn? You learn presence. Mm -hmm. You learn a oneness with an audience. Yeah. You learn a sense of of who you are mm -hmm. and what your own strengths are. Mm -hmm. But those are obvious to me, and, and I'm not a comedian. Yeah, those come pretty quickly. Yeah. I think like a stage presence comes pretty quickly, depending on who you are. How to write jokes and how to generate material and know it's going to work. That sort of comes, you know, first 10 years you're building the skills. Yeah. Uh, the basic but the skills, skills are what? Timing, delivery. Yeah, timing and delivery and material, you and know. Material the, that works. Generating the jokes. Because most comedians, you know, you write your own stuff, you come up with your own thing, uh, connecting with an audience. And then there's all sorts of other things that happen. Um, you know, the, your top, your best show keeps getting higher and higher. That's the first thing. Uh, how good you can do keeps increasing, but then the really important thing is how bad your worst show starts coming up. That's that I think that's for any performer. You know, your worst show needs to come up close to the best show, so that even on your worst night, yeah. you still. Okay, so in in the new season, yeah, your best show shouldn't the the worst show should be be much closer it to the best be, show. The margin should be like that. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. How how does that happen? Well, experience is just experience. Yeah. It's just, uh, you know, uh, there's hardly any situation that I that I haven't seen. So 
you know, when I feel an audience, uh, you know, you get an instinct for things. But did you have the power of observation always? You just had to learn how to shape it and, and form it. I mean, to see life mm -hmm. with a comedic eye. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's just the way I look at things. And, I, and I'm very curious, yeah. so I like to look at a lot of things. So I'm always out there looking at life and thinking about it. So I guess that's just observation. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's uh, it's being able to have people understand an observation, even if it's really from a strange place or even if it's very personal. So I guess the thing is, once you get really good at the skills and your bottom comes up, you're able to go try stuff that's probably not going to work. And that's mm -hmm. where you find, that's where you get more, that's where you get better and more interesting uh, when you're, you know, the good comics do that anyway. To read about you is to know that nothing, even close, is as important as your children. Yeah, easily. That, uh, being a dad is that's the most important job. And what do they think of the comedy? Do um, they love it? Did they say, yeah, they, it's they, not me, Dad. It's funny how you use us, but it's not me. Well, they, uh, the, the stand-up that I do, I've changed the way I talk about my kids just because... I like sharing my stand-up with my kids. I like showing them what I do. Yeah. And, um, you know, the first time I ever showwed, I showed my oldest daughter a bit I used to do about hide-and-seek, playing hide-and-seek. Oh, yes, tell me that story. Uh, with her, and it was about getting really frustrated that she was so, she would hide it in, in plain sight, literally. <laughs> and I would have to pretend she wasn't, yeah. that she was hiding better. And on stage I would say what, you know, what BS this was because she's, you know, I mean, I have to pretend she's good. And I would rail about it and get angry. And I showed this to her when she was, I don't know, six. And she laughed a lot because her younger sister it was like that now. Like, she was having to patronize her younger sister. Oh, I see. She was doing the same so thing. So she's like, to her sister, like what you it were doing is. Yeah, to she's her. like, I know exactly how you feel. And she was able to make that connection. That's and she great. also thought it was funny yeah. that I got so upset. She, she knew it was funny because in real life at home, I'm not like that. You know, I mean, I get upset like any parent does, yeah, but yeah. not unreasonably. So, so she thought, you know, she but knew. But would she I'm, say to her friends, I have the funniest dad in the world? He's the funniest man to be oh, around. Oh, jeez, I, I don't know. know. I mean, I what I hope is that her thoughts about me are as a father. As you a know? loving father. I'm yeah. there for her when she gets uh, off the bus from school. I'm there for her. I take her home. I cook her dinner. We do her homework together. And her sister, same thing. You know, so I take care of them. To me, that's what I want them to remember. I think of course. the work is like something that hopefully when they're like 18, 19, they'll they'll Google me and go, wow, this guy did a bunch of stuff while he was doing that, you know. <laughs> uh, it's not important to me that they... I like to model for them a good a good life in my career as far as, you know, trying really hard and being responsible. I tell them when it's something big is at stake and when it doesn't go well or when it does. I tell them that stuff as a role model, you know. Uh, but I could be doing the same thing if I was uh, working in some company making widgets or something, you know. What interests me about you, too, is you seem to be fascinated by how... Show business works. Mm -hmm, yeah, I mean, um, not only a student, but understanding the business model, mm -hmm. understanding. You know, I mean, there was a story I read about you once. Understanding that how much you would charge for a night to a mm -hmm. venue yeah. would affect how what they did and ticket prices, mm -hmm. because they had to suffer if they had not enough people there, didn't fill it up. Right, they had to have charged tickets as a kind of safety valve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you when you go work at a theater as a comic or as a musician or whatever, um, you know uh, they you try to get a big guarantee. That's sort of the 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 uh, conventional right. thing. Right. You get a bunch of money up front, and what that means is that whether the show goes well or not, you get to keep all that money. That's asking a lot, you know. So yeah. in order to hedge against that and make that not such a big risk, the venue needs to spend a lot of money on on um, uh, advertising right, promotion. and they need to uh, charge a lot of money for the ticket so that anybody that does buy tickets it, 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 they get a quicker you know so in the end you end up making less money if the place is sold out your guarantee will have caused so much money to be spent because once the place is sold out you, you divide the profits with the promoter mm. uh, that you both don't make that much money and the audience pays a lot of money for tickets um, but if you're willing to, I started to say, let's not have a guarantee. Let's just let's just both do our best, and then we could ask them to keep the advertising yeah. budget lower. We which both have an investment in this. Yeah. yeah, and and then also I wanted the fans to, to not. Yeah. I didn't want it to be difficult to come see me. I didn't. I get really sick physically when I see that like a ticket of mine costs like seventy five dollars. That's 
Hmm. That's just too, too much money. Yeah. So, but, but I mean, know. also, I mean, you did an amazing thing to me in a way, and I, I certainly identified it with it. Uh, when you put the thing on your website, yeah, and you said I'm gonna charge you five dollars, right? You know, and I hope you won't pirate it. Yeah, please don't uh, steal it. Right, pay, pay five dollars. I hope you yeah. enjoy it, uh, but don't steal it. Right. And amazingly, I mean, David Carr wrote a piece about this, as you know. Yeah. In the New York Times. Yeah, I talked to him. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. And and it worked. Yeah, it did. And it just says something very, very good. Well, the thing is, I kind of closed the gap. I also made the website very easy to use. Yeah. So I closed the gap between how easy it was to steal it and how easy it was to just buy it. Yes. And so, <laughs> you know, it was just so much because it you could go to my site and the $5 purchase was such a little bump in the road. Mm -hmm. It was almost like a viral video. Like, just yeah. click on this and watch it. But... Take one second, give us five bucks, and then you're over. That was actually easier, I think, for more pe most people than to go to some pirate site and find yeah. a way to torrent it. Yeah. So, you know, I think a lot of companies make it really tough for people to get stuff. And once something exists, if people can't get, buy it, they'll take it um, on the Internet. They feel entitled to everything that's on the Internet. So, um, you know, a lot of these companies, they, they put stuff out in stages or they say, you can only have it for one minute and we're going to take it back. Right. You know, when I went to Australia the first time, they had all were watching my show, and it wasn't on TV there, and it wasn't on iTunes or Netflix. They oh, were all on the internet. internet. Yeah. yeah, but it, regular people, not like crazy nerds, like regular family they folks. They all what? They all stole it. They yeah. all uh, downloaded it. Yeah. Because we're not letting them watch it. They, we're not even giving <sighs> them the opportunity. Yeah. And they all told me, if your show was available, we would buy it. But it's yeah. not. And, and the whole world knows about it, but us, it doesn't seem fair, so they just take it. Yeah. What's your relationship to other comedians? Do you watch them? Do you learn from them? Do you... Sure, yeah. I, I, I'm always a student of comedy. I really love watching a, any comedian. I'll watch yeah. any comedian and just hear the... You know, it's like studying the ocean or the waves. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's more than that. It's, it's interesting to me because, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by watching painters have told me. Mm -hmm. They go to the museum and they just look at it more clinically. Yeah, yeah, you study it. Ab, you're studying it. Yeah, sure. You're saying... Uh, Oh, that's how he did that. Power, I see that. Yeah. Look at that. That's right. And yeah. you do the same thing. Yeah, and it's hard to go out to. I mean, if I'm if I have time to go, like if I get a babysitter and run to a club to do a set, yeah. I might watch the guy before me, uh, but then I got to go home. So I don't get to do that like I used to. When you start out, when I started, I just I just devoured comedy. I went to clubs every night, even if I wasn't. Oh, man, I'd be I'm on stage so... maybe twice a week, but I was at clubs yeah. seven nights a week. Yeah. I'd watch every comedian I could, good or bad, friend or foe, didn't matter. I just watched and 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 uh, just loaded it into my system as. A, oh, I'm the same way about interview. You know? I mean, just watch, mm -hmm. see how they do it. Are they doing? If you're in London, watch everybody you can see. Right. Are they doing it differently? Is there is there a style that's interesting? Yeah. Because in the end, you have to be yourself. You have to find your own sense. But there's always something to learn about the approach that somebody makes. Whether it's a baseball player watching another baseball player. Right, because I mean, a baseball player is watching another player, but he's watching baseball. He's watching this. They're all doing the same game, you yeah. know? So the game is... So the same in stand-up, whatever the comic is doing is not in a vacuum. You're watching stand-up happen. You're right. watching how audiences are reacting. And the audience is such a mysterious animal to us, you know? So you're always kept guessing. There's some nights you go to a club and you're like... You know, I feel good. I'm ready to do have a good show. But the audience has a strange, un unanimous, uh, grumpy feeling to them or yeah. something. And how did they, all these people, they're all strangers to each other, <laughs> but they've, they're all sitting there. We hate exactly. this show. Yeah, like, how is this right. happening? I, I was and some common response. Yeah, yeah, so I'll never see enough shows to go, okay, I get this. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's an, in, an unquenchable thirst. You like Chris Rock. Yeah, he's, uh, he's a great guy. And we're both, we're very similar, you know. We grew up around the same time. Yeah. We had, you know, we were both listening to, you know, Van Halen and Led Zeppelin in yeah. two different worlds, but in the same East Coast feeling. And uh, and we always knew, we always knew each other coming up, but then when I, then he gave me a great job working for him. You know, I remember I was writing for his show, yeah. and we're all winning Emmys, everybody's happy. And one day I'm next to him and his monologue marked during rehearsal, and he turned to me and he said, uh, 
he said, when are you going to direct? When are you going to get out there and do your own thing? Yeah. He said, you know, I'm happy to have you here. It's like I have a minor league team and Barry Bonds is hitting home runs every day. But at yeah. some point, you have to look to Barry Bonds and say, yeah. you got to get out of here. Like, he, I was benef he was benefiting oh, from yeah, my work, yeah. but he wanted me out yeah. on my it own. It shows a good instinct in him. Yeah, he's yeah. always been like a, a, a big brother and a little brother to me at the same time. Does it come at a moment that you, I mean, you, you say... That thought comes to you yourself. I got it. You know, mm -hmm. I know that there has been a cumulative mass so that, mm -hmm. you know, I can go out. I don't need to write for somebody else. I need to write for myself. I need to get out there and face an audience. Sure. I mean, I was always and, doing... And I'm good enough. I was doing stand-up at the time, yeah. and, and I was getting off that way, you know, performance-wise. But I was putting all of this sort of, like, knowledge of, of how to make visual television funny and stuff and I was doing that with Chris and I'd done it with Conan and Letterman and a few other people um, as a writer but yeah around that time I started to think I, I should try to do this for, for me you know? it used to be said and David in an interview I did with David Letterman he, at the time that he got the Kennedy honors uh, we, we talked about Carson who he mm -hmm. loved and Carson in a sense was a guy who could anoint you as yeah, he did sure. for David and, and so many others is anyone playing that role today or anything not really it used to be that it used to be this you did you did one set on carson and if he liked it said he did this they called it the three ring sign that was the thing and then this? if he called this yeah if he did this yeah. that meant you know you're gonna fill every club in the country for at least a year and then there was the when he bring you over to the couch that yeah. was the big thing yeah. and then you were just a star right away that's the way it was when I was starting out. Yeah. And everybody was trying to get on Carson. And then the Letterman, the getting on Letterman was another version of that, where that meant you were the coolest new comic. Dude in town. Uh, but uh, after Carson, yeah. I remember I did a set on Letterman once, and it went really well. And at the time, I was writing for Dana Carvey. And I showed him my set. And he said, you know, when I was coming up, that set would have changed your life. Yeah. And, of course, but it didn't. I mean, I did Letterman, you know, I don't know, eight, ten times and. You know, Leno, all these shows, you do them a now, bunch of times. Is it the same set you carry around for a while, or do you constantly change it? Well, you can't repeat, really. You can't go do those no, shows well, and do those it again. Shows, but, I mean, in the, it, between those shows, uh, you're constantly at clubs. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. people like Seinfeld and, and Chris and then mm -hmm. still go sure. and, and try a set, don't they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, Just I show go up. to the cellars close to my house, so I go there all the time. And would and you stand up and, and throw a Go out there and try a bunch of stuff out. Yeah. yeah, just try out new stuff. I'm always trying out new stuff with the clubs. And Chris comes in, Jerry comes in, and they just go on. You know, you first go on, and the crowd's excited to see you. But the thing with stand up is that you can't you can't abuse that. Like they don't. The first joke you do that's not funny, you're just like anybody else, <laughs> right there. So actually, I've Chris and I have both said that we've done this. Is you try to ground their expectation. You actually do something that you know isn't going to please them yeah. to get their quickest. So you can get to work. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you go on stage, they're all going, yeah, because they've seen you on TV. That's yeah. There's nothing useful is going to come out of that. So you say something, I don't know, not insult the crowd, but you just sort of say something to take them down or bore them for a minute, and then you can get an yeah. honest read on the material. What have you been doing for the 19 months you've been off? Well, I did a big tour, um, a lot of stand-up shows, theaters all over the country, in, in the England and Norway, a bunch of places. And I did an HBO special that came out of that tour. And then I worked on the show. I worked on, uh, I spent more time, I, sp I usually start working on the show like in January and it would go on the air in June. So I'd do all the writing and everything and shoot it and cut it. You write everything? Yes. But this year I started writing in April for a show that went on the air in May. So I spent a whole year. On, I worked on the show for a whole year which is longer than I'd ever spent on it. So I, I did it more carefully this time. Is it like sculpturing? Uh, yeah, I was talking to a friend of mine recently about how, well, you know, there's two kinds of sculpture. There's addition to yeah, sculpture right. and a subtraction. Addition is where you have a, you keep adding clay till you yeah, get right, the right, right shape. Right, right. And subtraction is where there is a block and you cut away right, what right, isn't right, the thing right, right. till you're left with the thing. So with the show, it's, it's both. You start with addition, is shooting you're glomming on pieces you're cr you're compiling pieces and then you edit editing is really the creation of the show you're you're carving away what doesn't belong yeah. and making the it's the negative space around it that defines yeah. it you know it's, it, i mean it's amazing to me though but when you talk about it, it takes a year to build a show yeah i mean that's a lot of sculpturing isn't it 
Yeah, and every you just keep layering and making sure it's good. I so spend every a lot moment is perfect. No, no, no. It's all wild. It's like a, I mean, now no more perfect than if you're growing like a, a garden. Yeah, right, you know, right. it's not perfect. Yeah. I mean, except uh, maybe there's English gardens where the rows and the hedges. <laughs> this is more Closer, like a yeah, right, wild, right, 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 crazy right. woman's garden, and she's yeah. got you know too many dogs and stuff. Yeah. yeah. How important is the beginning when you first hit the stage? Uh, it's pretty huge when you start. Because if you don't have the right footing with the crowd, uh, you're lost. But when you get to be a veteran, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. <laughs> you mean, you, you walk out there, and if you don't get them right there, you'll get applause because they know you, and, yeah. and you're a big, the king of comedy. But uh, you know that even if, for whatever reason, you can get them. Yeah, it doesn't matter. And as a matter of fact, you can lo throw them back and get them back again. <laughs> that's, that's where you get really great. That's where you can get really good because you can just go, you guys go away. You can piss them <laughs> off and then you go, yeah, I know you seem like you're upset. Because when you're on stage, you tell, you know the future. Yeah. You control the future. They don't know what you're going to say, but you do. It's yeah. a very unique thing that way. You can't, you, they, you can never fail if you think of it the right way. So once you get to that place where you can just kind of go backwards and forwards, anger them, make them happy, get them in a frenzy, bore them, and you know how to control that... That gives you the ability to try a lot of different different things. What has the addition of movies made to you? The fact that Woody Allen, the uh, fact that you were in the uh, American Hustle. Yeah. I mean, David, well, pretty good directors in both cases. Yeah, yeah, both, both what excellent. What does that add to you for you in terms of satisfaction? I loved working with both of those guys. They're both great and dynamic, interesting to watch directors. So I like being a spectator, so being on a... I mean, I oh, like yeah, going, I going to a Woody yeah, Allen movie, right. but getting to be in the front, that's about a front row seat as you can get. While he's making the movie, you're yeah, right you're there. In it. Yeah, you're actually right, on right. the set. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like a floor floor seat at the, at the Celtics or yeah. Knicks game, but I get to be in the game, you know? Yeah. So to me, that's what I enjoyed from it. And, uh, and these were short enough shoots that I was able to just sort of put them in my life. But without. you can do drama as well as comedy. I like to. I like to act a real scene where something mm -hmm. real is going on. Yeah, David's movie was funny, but it was yeah, you exactly. Know, it was more of a drama, I guess. Yeah. Uh, take a look at this. This is a scene from an earlier season of Louis uh, talking about the car he drives. Here it is. My life is really evil. Like I, there are people who are starving in the world, and I drive an infinity. That's really evil. There are people who just starve to death. That's all they ever did. There's people who are, like, born, and they go, oh, I'm hungry, and then they just die. <laughs> and that's all they ever got to do. And meanwhile, I'm in my car, boom, 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 like, having a great time, and I sleep like a baby. <laughs> it's totally my fault, because I could, I could trade my Infinity for, like, a really good car, like a nice Ford Focus with no miles on it and I'd get back like $20,000. And I could save hundreds of people from dying of starvation with that money. And every day I don't do it. Every day I make them die with my car. <laughs> what, yeah. When was that? You know? That was 2010, I guess. Yeah. That was the first year of the show. I think that was from the pilot. I think yeah, it was maybe from, from the pilot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 2009, 10, something like that. Chris Rock told you, make specials a masterpiece. Yeah, you try to, yeah. Because yeah. they have longevity. They you know, yeah. want to make them something that, that's always... Almost a sculpturing thing that we've talked about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah specials are something. It's to me, I used to describe it like a, um, the way they make samurai swords, or used to, yeah. that they bang it and then fold it and then bang it again, yeah. and then they fold it and keep banging it. So, you know, they pound on it. Right. And they fold it so that they're squeezing out all the all the oxygen that's in the. You know what I mean? Yeah, Just right. keep making it perfect. So every time you think I've got an hour, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. Write another hour and then and fold it into it. that one, yeah. and and then get rid of all the impurities and all the bad stuff, and then keep doing that. I had a lot of process. I used to do like everything that was my close. You know, your big closing bit. Yeah. Your closing bit can make you very uh, um, sluggish. You know, uh, kind of lazy. Because about 20 minutes into your set, you're like, I'm, you know, it's a 60-minute set usually, or maybe 90. Yeah. So, like, 20 minutes in, 
you're now 20 minutes away from your big 20 minute closer, which you know is not going to fail. Closes 20 minutes. You know, well, if you got a really good strong right, one. Right. So, but so 20 minutes in, you're like, I can coast for 20 minutes because I got this thing. <laughs> yeah. So I started making life hard for myself by opening with the closer. Like, let's That's open it, man. with the hardest material, yeah. and then now I'm in a much worse shape. So then you got a long way to go. Yeah. Then I have to follow it. I yeah. have to follow my toughest material with stuff that's pretty weak and I have no closer. I have nothing to depend on. <laughs> There's just an open wound at the end. So, yeah. but if I did that, then this bit would just through need, it would cauterize and become the closer. And then you put that at the beginning and you keep doing that until you have hopefully 90 minutes of closing bits where you could just flop them out and it doesn't yeah. matter what order you I mean, that doing. ought to be a prescription for everybody to be able to take a hard look and make sure you're not coasting and turn it upside down. I mean, somebody once said about a business model, you mm -hmm. ought to blow it up every 10 years. Right. You might as well. I mean, yeah. what would be the point of doing this kind of crazy stuff yeah. if you're not trying to really do your the best version of your well, Can you imagine doing something in five years not whether it's under the broad umbrella of comedy and, and film and entertainment, but can you imagine doing something that you that just would never occur to you today? I mean, is there is part of your mindset today, being mm -hmm. as successful as you are, I want to really push the boundaries and the frontiers of whatever. Well, I'd, I'd love to do new things. I love to learn. Learning is my favorite thing. So yeah. if something came across, I don't look at my career as like, I want to do the biggest thing. So like, if I get offered something that's like, you're going to be the blockbuster, you're going to be the, you know, the, the, this, you're going to put on an animal suit and be this guy, and you're going to get paid $50 trillion. I wouldn't, to me, that's not interesting, but something, yeah, I mean, I don't know what it is. Yeah, if but, somebody said it, uh, they want you to go do this, yes, I would, I'm, yeah, I'm excited but that's for that. But that's where your head is. Yeah, like Push maybe somebody will say, go to Hungary and make a TV station in Hungary. All yeah. right, I'll try it. I'll try that, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. This. this is another season from the show talking about being single. Here it is. <laughs> it's uh, not fun to be single at 41. I was married for 10 years. I'm divorced. I got two children. It's hard to start again after a marriage. It's hard to really, like, look at somebody and go, hey, maybe something nice will happen. You just don't... I know too much about life to have any optimism. Because I know even if it's nice, it's going to lead to shit. I know that if you smile at somebody and they smile back, you've just decided that something is going to happen. You might have a nice couple of dates, but then she'll stop calling you back, and that'll feel shit. Or you'll date for a long time, and then she'll have sex with one of your friends, or you will with one of hers, and that'll be sh Or you'll get married, and it won't work out, and you'll get divorced and split your friends and money, and that's horrible. Or you'll meet the perfect person who you love infinitely, and you even argue well, and you grow together, and you have children, and then you get old together, and then she's going to die. <laughs> The best case scenario is that you're going to lose your best friend and then just walk home from D'Agostino's with heavy bags every day and wait for your turn to be nothing also. That's genius. <laughs> That's pretty genius. bleak. <laughs> so what do we expect in the new season? Uh, well, it's a very different season than the other three. Um, there's bigger stories. I have one story that's six episodes long, and it's, uh, um, and then there's another one that's two episodes, and then other. They're, they're, it's all connected this year. Um, I mean, each episode stands alone and it has yeah. its own little when you story. Say story. What does that mean? Well, when I write this show, because my network does, FX doesn't make me turn scripts in. Oh, they don't read it first. Yeah. They don't give you notes either. No, they don't. And when you when you turn in scripts to a network, it means you have to finish them and yeah. you have to define it all and have it yeah. all be very neat. Here's episode one. Here's episode two. But I just write stories however long they are. And I had this one story that kept going, and then it was like 100 pages. So I just shot it. We didn't care. We didn't say when we were shooting it what episode we're shooting we just shot the hundred pages yeah. then there was another one that was like 60 pages one that was like four pages so i just shoot the stories themselves it doesn't really matter how they fit together and then when i edited it i figured out well this one's six six and a half episodes really this one's three and you know so uh it it it, it kind of most people watch a whole season just all at once now anyway so it doesn't really matter it is great to have you here same, same here great really. to be here thank, thank you. you charlie thanks Lucy for having me. Kay. Back in a moment. Stay with us.